Good morning, everyone, and Shabbat, Shabbat shalom. shalom. We are thankful yet again for another opportunity to be in the house of God, also to teach the word, another Sabbath that he has given us, another day of rest. We are thankful that he has brought us through another week. Uh, hope we worked hard, and now we're ready to just chill out and relax. So if you will, let us all stand and turn to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17, and we'll start 1 through 6. And it came to be when Abram was 99 years old that Hashem appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, Almighty God, walk before me and be perfect, and I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. And Abram fell on his face, and Elohim spoke with him, saying, As for me, look, my covenant is with you, and you shall become a father of many nations. And no longer is your name Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, because I shall make you a father of many nations. And I shall make you bear fruit exceedingly, and make nations of you, and sovereigns shall come from you. Let's lift up our eyes. Shem, Adonai, Elyon, Most High, thank you for this day that you have given us. You have set this day apart. May we recognize you as the one who sets us apart, uh, continue to lead and guide us in our lives. Uh, we just pray for your mercy on us. Uh, we don't understand all things, but we are looking for truth, and we want to know you. Uh, we want to come to have a better understanding of you, not just for ourselves, but also for the congregation, uh, for the people, uh, anyone that comes to understand your truth, uh, that they would have a closer walk with you, that we would make it personal, and a personal desire for all the people uh, to draw close to you. Please be with us. Uh, we pray that you'd give us a steady mind, a clear mind, a clear heart, that we would teach your word and truth, uh, that the people would come to understand you greater, uh, that you would bless the people. Uh, we do pray over anyone that might not know you, uh, that you would use us uh, to reveal truth, but that we would be solid and that we would understand and have a greater understanding as we grow. Uh, be with us as a people, be with us as a group, uh, be with this message. I pray that it would bless the people. We lift you up on high through Hashem. Hallelujah. Amen. So, starting in Genesis 16, we look at Abraham here. Uh, so we have Abraham, who was Abram, and God is about to change his name. As we talked about last week, uh, if you look at what is written in the Bible, when you look what's written in the Tanakh and the Torah, each name defines something as the person. So why was Abraham called Abraham? because he was considered to be the father of many nations. So each person or character in the Torah has a specific meaning and a specific purpose in the scripture, okay? Each of their, um, each of their endeavors, each of the circumstances that they go through. Uh, you look at Jacob, why was Jacob called Jacob? Because he came out second and he caught Esau's heel. So each one has a specific name. Your name serves a purpose. Your name is very important. Okay, we talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, your name carries your purpose. It carries your plan. So I hope that even through that, that we look to see what our names meant. Because that is your purpose and that is your plan. Or that is God's plan as we see God as Ale. So, and it came to be when Abram was 99 years old that Hashem, El, appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, the Almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. So walk. That is halak, to go before me, walk before me, come before me, make your manner of life and behave before me. Behave before me and be tamim, perfect. Now, our idea of perfect is perfection. Everything must be right. A lot of times when we are dealing with others in our lives, uh, they don't do it our way, therefore it's not perfect. There are other ways to do things. You have to realize that. Uh, and you also have to look through other people's eyes in order to understand why they do things the way that they do. It is all about perception, okay? We have all been from childhood raised a certain way. Therefore, when we see the same thing, we perceive it differently, okay? We can see it differently. And it's good that you build groups because... Uh, especially if you're trying to build something or accomplish something, it's good to have different perspectives of one item. Have you ever been working on something that someone comes uh, to you and says, well, look at this. Oh, I didn't think of that. It's because you were seeing it through your own eyes. There is a different perception. There is a different objectivity to it. So we must be able to see something through other people's eyes. Uh, talking about being perfect. We have this blamelessness that has been ingrained in us. 
But the word tamim actually means complete. Walk before me and be complete. We're going to talk about this right now while we're thinking about this topic. Life is a composition of want and lack of want. Okay? I need this. I don't need this. Okay? Pleasure and unpleasantness. Many people are on the pursuit for happiness. Right? We have talked about that before. You will always be wanting if you are on the pursuit of happiness. So what is the answer? What is the goal? Contentment and thankfulness. That is the answer. Okay? Am I saying you don't strive to do better? No, I am not. But you must first radically accept where you are before you can grow. If you don't like where you currently are, that's when you start making new decisions to change your behavior, your attitude, your life. You must first radically accept, accept I am here now before you can change it. Okay? So, life is a composition of pleasure and unpleasantness. A lot of times we are just wanting to alleviate the suffering in our lives, correct? I'm suffering through this right now, so how can I make this better? But you have to realize that even though life is a balance of both pleasure and unpleasantness, there has to be some sort of well-being that is in the middle that no matter what happens, you can still be happy. And you know what that is? Presently living. That's what it is. The answer is presently living. I was, I'm in this book called Waking Up, and it's really good. Because the guy talked about how we are looking toward the future in order to bring us to a path that leads us back to the present. Let me see if I can find what I said here. All wants, all desires are a path that leads us back to the present. Like, Josh, what in the world are you talking about? If I had a car, I would be happy. If I had a house, I would be happy. If I had a spouse, if I made more money, I would be happy. If only my kids would listen, I would be happy. So all paths, all future paths lead us back to the present. So the answer is presently living, being thankful, and also content with what you have. If you don't like the way your children are acting, acting change that. Start new behaviors. And you also have to realize that the life that you are leading now is accumulation of past decisions, past actions, past interactions, past circumstances. So in order for you to change who you are today, you have to be patient with yourself enough to see the end goal. Correct? It doesn't just happen overnight. If your children are acting a certain way and you want to change that, if your body comp composition is not the way you want it, it's going to take time. So have some mercy on yourself. Be tender with yourself. It takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. Okay? So, life is a composition of want and lack of want, pleasure and unpleasantness. There has to be a sense of well-being without the influence of either. That's kind of like no matter what happens to me, I'm going to be content. I'm going to work through it. I'm going to realize that life is a timeline. It is spread out. To the point to where it's going to take time. It's going to be okay. I don't have to figure it all out now. I'll figure it out as it comes. And I'll put my attention into it when it needs it. Okay? Because we bear our burdens and the burdens are so heavy because of the cares of this world. Everything that's on us. But all the past cares that you've had, you figure them out one at a time. So be patient with yourself. Don't get ahead of yourself. I want you to know this morning that everything plays out according, accordingly. It always does. Why are you worried about it? It always plays out. Always. So, there has to be a sense of well-being. We could call that trust. We could call that faith. That says, no matter what comes upon me, I'm content. But you also, like the, the song was called, uh, talking about this morning, Counting Every Blessing, you've got to see God in your life. You've got to want to see God in your life. That's your perception. You've got to see the blessings. I'm counting every blessing. You've got to see that in your life. And it's good to have a partner that can help you see those things sometimes, even when things are rough. 
when things aren't going your way to encourage you and say, it's going to be okay. You know why? Because it's always been okay. <laughs> it's okay right now and it's going to be okay. No matter what. So let me give you an example here. Life is a composition of want and lack of want. So the sun comes out. Oh, that feels so good. But you stay there long enough, you start to burn up. <laughs> and then what do you want to do? You want to go get in the shade. But when you sit in the shade, sometimes the breeze comes through. I need a sweater. All oh, this sweater's kind of worn out. I need to get a new sweater. Life is a composition of want and lack of want. So you have to realize, because that's what floods my mind, all the things that need to be done. All the things that need my attention. Okay? There has to be a sense of it's going to be okay. That faith and that trust that no matter what, everything's going to work out. And it does. It does. The past problems that you have or had, where are they now? Where are they? I've been through some rough spots in my life, but they're gone now. So any current thing that you might be going through also will pass. How do you live your life? Why can't we enjoy our life? I love in Ecclesiastes, it talks about when you die, where does the angry or where does the anger go? Where does the depression go? Where does it all go? What was it worth? He said, there's nothing better than to enjoy your life. Eat and drink. This is the gift of God. How are you enjoying your life? Smiling a little bit more. You know, I, it's really funny um, watching Transformers and then her parents come up and say, uh, here's a book. All you got to do is just smile a little bit more. It does affect your composition that's in your brain if you just smile. It does. Just smile. Enjoy what you have. That's where you get that covetousness. It's not that you can't want the same thing. It's that you're trying to take what that person has. That's covetousness. You can want a brand new shiny red car, but when you want to steal your neighbor's car, that's where it gets wrong. That's where it's bad. And that's where it creates that suffering. The suffering of the covetousness is within you. So awareness, self-awareness is very important. But in order to do that, you must first learn yourself. You must be able to dig. Some people are afraid to sit in silence. It says it takes a person who has their thoughts in order to sit in silence. What do you got to do? You got to keep the TV on. You got to turn the radio on. How many of us listen to fans as we go to sleep? Because we like the white noise. It takes a person who has their thoughts in order and to sit in silence because it's just you and your mind. And ultimately, as we continue on through this, we will see that that is what we are fighting. It's self. It's self. No one ruins you worse than you ruin yourself. No one sets you up worse than you set yourself up. No one talks worse about you than you do yourself. So we're all battling something internally, and it's our mind. It's yourself. And a lot of times, how often have you made up a scenario when you are with someone, say it's in a relationship, and the scenario is not true because you made it up. It's a story you made up. It's us. So, all paths lead back to the present. All wants our path that leads back to the present. If I had this, if I had that, if I had this, contentment and gratitude is your answer. Perfection, as he talks about here, walk before me and be perfect, or soundness. That's what Tamim is. Complete, whole, sound, integrity. Walk before me in your integrity. Walk before me and be innocent. Walk before me and be sincere. Abraham, we have sincerity towards God, yes? That's what he's asking for. And as you continue on, you see Abraham, and you see his children. He said, I know that you will teach your children these things. Walk before me and be sincere. 
You also have perfection in there or perfect, but the integrity is the ability to do what's right even though no one is watching. That's integrity. We don't need anyone's praise. We don't need anyone's recognition. And that's what I want to say this morning too. I'm glad that he reminded me of that. When it comes to our children, we do want to teach our children that there are rewards for doing certain things. Correct? Yes. But you also have to recognize in real time that you don't always get rewarded for the good things that you do. Is that correct? Sometimes people don't see. Sometimes people don't notice. So you have to teach your children that also. Sometimes you just do it because it's your responsibility. Nobody recognizes me because I go to work every Monday morning. Of course you're appreciated. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is, how many people when you're at your job say thank you? I'm glad for the hard work you do. We're so divided. We're so separated. Everyone's in their own world. So, and you know what that world is? It's your primary world. It's this brain. So, walk before me and be sound. To be sound is to not be easily persuaded. It is to be solid. Sound. That means content no matter what. You know what also that means? Calm in the storm. When chaos is around you, do you find something to appreciate? Do you find a reason to be sound? You know what's also good and shows a healthy brain? Finding things to laugh at when you're in a bad situation. Perfection or soundness is not easily persuaded. It is solid, calm in the storm. So El Shaddai, Almighty God, says, Walk before me and be sound. And I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. And Abraham, Abram fell on his face and Elohim spoke with him saying, As for me, look, my covenant is with you and you shall become the father of many nations. And no longer is your name called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham because I shall make you a father of many nations. And I shall make you bear fruit exceedingly and make nations of you and sovereigns or leaders, kings shall come from you. So it's very important that we remember that as we continue on through this scripture. So we have perfection or soundness is not easily persuaded. It is content and it is thankful. Notice, Abraham is the father of many nations. Let's reword that. Many nations call Abraham their father. It makes a lot more sense now, doesn't it? So, let's get that. Genesis 18. So he's talked to uh, Elohim here, El, and then we're going into Genesis 18, verse 17. So, and Hashem said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? So you have Abraham in the tent. Uh, he's now telling them through the messengers that they're going to have a child. Um, you shall have a child about this time next year. And now the two of them have left to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of them has stayed to convey the message of El to Abraham. So, uh, Verse 17, and Hashem said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? So when you have that close relationship, and I think that we can bear witness of that, maybe you can call it empathy, empathizing, intuition, whatever you want to call it, but intuitiveness. He knew through God what was going to happen. He revealed to him what was going to happen. Okay, so. Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham is certainly going to become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. How are we blessed in Abraham? Verse 19, for I know him, I see him, I perceive him, yada. I have experienced him, I observe him so that he commands his children and his household after him. So the many nations that call Abraham his father, their father, these are the ones that hold on to this. For I know him so that the, he commands his children and his household after him to guard, shamar, preserve, protect, treasure up the way of Hashem. So the way is direct. That is manner, habit, way, course of life, moral character, mode of action, and custom. So righteousness drives L, correct? 
He essentially wants unity and peace in the world. Tell me if I'm wrong. What happens at the very end? All the nations come. Peace on earth, right? No more religion. All see God. Yes? Yes. yes. So we see that. That's the ultimate goal. So, goal. so what drives God? Mercy and truth. That's what drives him. He is wanting mercy and truth in the world and unity in the world through mercy and truth. Why can't we all just get along? Because we're so divided. We've been taught to be divided. We've been taught to be at each other's throats. We've been taught to kill and destroy each other. Whether you're doing it physically or emotionally or mentally, people can put you through that type of anguish also. Pain does not have to be physical. It can also be emotional and it can also be mental. If you're struggling with your thoughts, that is mental anguish. To teach him the way, the habit, course of life, mode of action, what drives God? Righteousness. He wants right. Why do you think that he cares for the fatherless and the widow? Why do you think that he cares for the stranger? He said, treat them well for you were strangers also. Why do we skip out on these parts? What has happened to our humanity? We talked about before in one of our daily disciplines, if you see the need, feed it. If there is a need there, feed it. And the simplest forms I can teach you is if you see that your laundry needs to be done, do it. If you see the dishes need to be done, do it. If you see that your child needs attention, do it. Just a moment with your child changes their whole life. It changes their whole aspect. You are building a connection with your children, just like we talked about last week. And same thing with God. God is wanting a connection with you. And in order to interact with God, you need to build that personal connection. Okay? But not only does he punish or correct, because we've all felt that, We've all felt the correction of our own actions, but also he praises. He praises. Have you ever felt the peace of God in your life? Even though chaos is going around you, just that uh, serenity that comes over you, and that serenity says what? Everything's gonna be okay. To know his way, I know that he will teach his children to guard the way of hell and to do righteousness, Zedekiah, justice, righteousness in government, truthfulness and salvation. He will teach his kids to deliver. You think about Abraham and Lot. So what happened? All the kings, they were having a war and what happened? Let's giddy up and go get Lot, right? He cared about his family. He wanted to protect his family. That's compassion. So, he continues on. He wants righteousness, truthfulness, and salvation. To do righteousness and right ruling. That right ruling is judgment, mishpat, right, judgment. The act of deciding which way, this or that. Decision, proper, fitting, and plan. So the proper decision. What is fitting? The plan, okay? Now, ultimately, we all make decisions in our life, every single one of us. We have all made bad decisions. We have all made good decisions. I was listening to a preacher yesterday as he was preaching, and he said, I notice all my faults. I notice all my shortcomings. I notice all of this, and we have been taught to do that. We have been trained to do that. We have been trained to only see fault and not to see the good. I'm trying to get the people to understand this. And I was talking to somebody about that this week. You are a good person. There is good within you. You can do good. It's there. Tell me you've never done a kind deed or a kind act. The kindness exceeds when you do something that is right and the person cannot repay you. And also, do never expecting anything in return. You know why? Because you start to keep tallies. I did this for you. Now you must do this for me. And then you have contentment. What's contentment? Superiority. 
If you ever think about your spouse or your friends that you are better than they are, you are more, you're smarter than they are, stronger, whatever. If you ever think that, you're having superiority over them. And that's going to cause division. It definitely causes division in relationships. Remember, you are a team. There is no such thing as I did this, you owe it to me. That goes back to feed the need. You do it because you want to. Not because you're ever expecting anything back. That's love. That's an expression of love. Because otherwise, you're going to start keeping tabs. I did this and you didn't do anything. And it's going to cause toxicity in your relationship. Contentment and superiority. So, he will teach them right ruling so that Hashem brings to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So we see through all of that, the blessing comes, right? The blessing comes through that. These are the children of Abraham, no matter what nation. Moral character, the way of Hashem. Righteousness and truth, proper decision-making skills. Some things you learn the hard way through your mistakes. But continuing to repeat that, you haven't learned anything. So you must learn. And sometimes it does take more than once. Because you know why? You've already developed a pattern. We have been taught to be so hard on ourselves. We have been taught that to teach ourselves, and like we talked about earlier, there's no one uh, who is a greater enemy than the enemy of self, ego. Why'd you do that, stupid? How many times did you say that to yourself? Why are we so harsh on ourselves? We browbeat ourselves. We're dead. We look down on ourselves. Why? You make mistakes. That's okay. Mistake is the greatest learner. The greatest teacher. You have learned more through your mistakes than you have through the times that you did something right. So have mercy on yourself. It's okay. Even if you mess up again, it's okay. I tell you, has God ever left you? Has he left you now? Is he going to leave you? That's the faith that I have. When he said, walk before me and be perfect, he said, be sincere. Notice. These are the children of Abraham, no matter what nation, moral character, righteousness and truth, proper decision-making skills. Kings shall come from you. That is great leaders. Shall come from you. Exodus 3. Exodus 3 and verse 1. And Moshe was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the Kohen of Midian. And he fled, uh, he led the flock to the back of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of Elohim. And the messenger of Elohim appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked and saw the bush burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And Moshe said, Moshe, let me turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So what is light a representation of its knowledge? And we'll get to that too. And Hashem... Saul, saw that he turned aside to see, and Elohim called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moshe, Moshe, and he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near here. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is Kodesh, set apart ground, holy. And he said, I am the Elohim of your father, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yitzhak, and the Elohim of Jacob. And Moshe hid his face, for he was afraid to look at Elohim. And Hashem, Elohim, said, I have indeed seen the oppression of my people who are in Mitzrayim and have heard their cry because of their slave drivers, for I know their sorrows. I have experienced, I have seen, I have treasured up, that is still yada, the oppression. Verse uh, seven, I have treasured up the oppression, that is affliction, on me. I have seen their affliction, I have seen their poverty, I have seen their misery, I have seen their depression, I have seen their trouble. Okay, it continues on. 
the oppression of my people who are in Mitzrayim, and I've heard their cry, that is sa'achara, sa'achara, cry, outcry, I have heard their shriek, I have heard their distress. He continues on. Because of their slave drivers, for I know their sorrows. That sorrow is machob. It is pain, sorrow. That is physical pain. I see their mental pain, their anguish, and grief. I see it. I know it. So since he sees this and he's talking to Moshe, what's his plan? What's he going to do? He's come to deliver the people. If we had a title for the message, it's called, It Only Takes One. It only takes one. If you have a group of people and they have the same mind and they're feeling the same anguish and the same pain and the same oppression, it is the same oppression, but we all feel it differently, okay? I want you to get that and understand that. Your pain is particular to you and only you. So you can have a collective amount of people under the same slavery feeling different pains about it, right? But it only takes one to deliver the people. It only takes one to make a stand. It only takes one to lead them out. So you see God and how he acts and the people are oppressed, the people are suffering mental and physical anguish. And what does he do? I see it. Time to take action. So it only takes one person led by God to take a stand. Leading the people from bondage. One. He said, I have seen it. And I have come down to deliver them from the land of the Mitzrites to bring them up from the land, a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to place... Uh, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hiawites and the Jebusites. And now see, the cry of the children of Israel has come up to me. And I have also seen the oppression. The oppression is lachatz. Oppression, distress, I've seen the pressure. And I have come to deliver. With which the Mitzrites oppressed them and now come. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Mitzrayim. It only takes one person. When you have a collective amount of people that are weak, it takes one to take a stand and the people are ready to follow. Exodus 1. Let's get something about Israel. We've talked about this before, but I thought it was really interesting when I, I read it again this morning. So you have Exodus 1 and verse 7. And the children of Israel bore fruit and increased very much, multiplied and became very strong, and the land was filled with them. Then a new sovereign arose over Mitzrayim who did not know Yosef. And he said to his people, See, the people of the children of Israel are more and stronger than we. Come, let us act wisely towards them, lest they increase, and it shall be when fighting befalls us that they shall join our enemies and fight against us and shall go up out of the land. So they appointed slave masters over them to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pitam and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they increased and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. Matt, which verse am I trying to get to? And the Mitzrites made the children of Israel serve with harshness, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick and in all kinds of work in the field. All their work which they made them do was with harshness. They may have been strong in number, but they were weak in mind. So the battle that you are fighting is within yourself. It is your own mental capacity. They were strong in number, said they are more than us and stronger than us. Let's oppress them. Through the oppression, the people are weakened because it's a mental anguish that they were going through. Not only were they experiencing the physical pain, 
they were experiencing the mental abuse. This is the mind. This is the battle. Your own prison and suffering. Think about uh, your own prison and suffering. I don't know why. Oh, yes. Okay. Now, now I know why I did that. So your own prison and suffering. It is the idea that we perceive it to be. And what that means is, do you not think that it's strange that people feel pain when exercising, but we assume that it is good? Right? When you lift and you feel, uh, you feel the burning of your muscles, you know that it's activating and you perceive it to be a good thing. So that's all our idea of it. Why can't all pain be like that? Because we perceive it to be bad. It's your perception. It's your mind. We make up that story. We've been told that story. You don't know how powerful that your mind really is. We set ourselves up. We destroy our esteem. We talk or speak evil of ourselves. We discourage ourselves. We tell ourselves there is no hope. It only takes one. One moment with someone can change their life. You can't change the whole world. Maybe not. But you know what? You can affect someone's world and change their aspect. I don't plan on changing the world, but I do want to have an influence on your life or anyone that sees this. And it can be a positive influence. Uh, there was uh, Jim Rohn, he was talking about that and he said, there's no greater reward. He said, this is why I do this, for someone to mention your name in their testimony. This person never gave up on me. This person really tried. This person sh showed up. And then they mention you. Be that person. It only takes one. We are a slave in our own minds. We discourage ourselves. We destroy our own self-esteem. We talk or speak evil of ourselves. We discourage ourselves. We tell ourselves there is no hope. You can't do it. And you know what? That's the slavery. They were more in number and they were stronger. Why in the world did they stay? To our own ego and perception. If you tell someone they're a slave, what do they believe? You're a slave. But if you can set someone free and give them the ability to think for themselves... They are truly free because knowledge is the light. Knowledge is the freedom. But if you continue, as we talk about no telling how many times, to recycle the same habits, recycle the same thoughts, how can we ever expect growth, change? So you've got to put new in in order to become new. In order to change, you must first be willing to change. So it is our own ego. It is our perception through the first story. It's that story you continue to tell yourself. It's the story that you continue to recycle. It's that same old dead horse that you continue to beat. And you wonder why you can't get out. I tell you right now this morning that there is help for you. If you want it, there is help. There are books. There are psychologists. There's help. If you are in mental anguish, help yourself. Get help. Because it's out there for you. Through exercise. And what does that exercise mean? There, you are exercising your brain. How do you exercise your brain? Through different things that you put into practice. New teachings and practice. You can change your life. And this is what I was thinking also this week. It's pretty interesting. Why, whenever we start eating well, do we feel good? Okay, we feel good and then we go back. You know why? Because it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. We want something better. 
Interesting. So we think whenever I eat that cake, I'm going to feel better than I already do. And it makes you feel worse. True? True. So why can't we just be content where we are with what we're doing? Because it works. It's because we want to feel better. I feel great now, but I want to feel better. So we go back and it makes you feel worse. These are exercises. These are practices. This is how you put new information into your brain. You're getting rid of that old and you're putting in the new. This is how you become a new person. So, what's your versed story? What do you tell yourself? You know, self-talk, it can be the most debilitating or uplifting thing ever. Do you encourage yourself or do you just call yourself stupid? How do you talk to yourself? That's called self-talk. Because this is your mind. How are you controlling it? And this is another example, okay? So uh, I've been trying to get off caffeine, okay? So like, I'm trying to cut back on caffeine. I'm trying to, okay? I'm not saying I'll never drink it again, but I'm saying like, I feel good now. When I go to the gym, I'm not caffeinated up, okay? And when I'm doing those exercises, I remember I was going to do... Um, a tricep exercise, dips is what it's called, where you dip down and then you push back up for your triceps. So I was going to do that, but I did not want to do another set. My mind is telling me, you don't want to do that next set. I conquered my mind and I got up there and I did the next set without even thinking about it. I was already trying to deceive myself that you don't want to do that. And I was already stepping up to do it. So you have the power to overcome this body through your mind by teaching it new practices. So they were more in number. Why were they in bondage? They were stronger. Why were they in bondage? Because it was mental slavery. They had oppressed them. Exodus 2 and verse 11. And in those days, it came to be when Moshe was grown. So I really liked that, uh, that let's see if I can find that definition. There it is. So I really like that definition for grown because I wasn't thinking that it's grown in stature. There had to be something behind that this morning. So grown is good doll. It is to become great and important. So when Moses had become great and important, when Moses was promoted, when Moses became powerful, when Moses was magnified, he was praised, he was excellent, he was nourished. When Moses became grown, Gadol, when he was grown, that he went out to his brothers and looked at their burdens, and he saw a Mitzrite beating a Hebrew, one of his brothers, and he turned this way and that way, and he saw no one. So we did that message about uh, the man, be the man. So that word is not one, it's not a chad, it is actually ish, or ish, it is man. He saw no man, he saw no champion. He saw no great one. Excellent. Uh, he saw no great man. There was no man. He looked to the left and he looked to the right and he's like, are we gonna let this happen? So he turned this way and that way, and when he saw no one, he smote the Mitzrite and hid him in the sand. And he went out the second day and saw two Hebrews fighting. And he said to the one, who did the wrong? Why do you smite your neighbor? And he said, who made you a head and a judge over us? Do you intend to slay me as you slew the Mitzrite? And Moshe feared and said, truly, the matter is known. Now you can also see that he's depicting it as he wanted to hide himself because he was going to kill the man and then put him in the sand. But he said, now it's known. So you look at this. Why was Moshe chosen? Why? This made Moses a leader, the one God chose because he wanted to help the people. He wanted to deliver the people. He saw his brothers in pain, so he wanted to deliver them. 
This is why. Physically and mentally. Isaiah 42. Be the man who stands up against injustice. Isaiah 42, verse 5. Thus said El. We'll read through all this. Isaiah 42, verse 1. See my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, my being has delighted in. I have put my ruach, my spirit, instruction upon him. He brings forth right ruling, that is decision making, to the nations. He does not cry out, nor lift up, nor causes his voice to be heard in the street. So that's all nations. A crushed reed he does not break, a smoking flax he does not quench. He brings forth right ruling in accordance with truth. He does not become weak or crushed until he has established right ruling in the earth and the coastlands wait for his Torah. What is Torah? Instruction. Way. Waits for the way. Thus said the El, Hashem, who created the Shemaim and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and the spirit to those who walk in it. I am Hashem. I have called you in righteousness. I take hold of your hand and guard you and give you for a covenant to the people for a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. What's the prison? Your own mentality. He's giving you knowledge. He says, I bring the Torah. I bring the instruction. I bring the direction. I bring the way. So knowledge, wisdom. This is what sets you free. You know why you're in bondage? Because you have not educated yourself. That's why. Because you are continuing to recycle those thoughts. Have you ever wondered why you are the way you are? Why you behave the way you do? Think the things you think. There are answers. You can be set free from the bondage of your own mind. And as I talked about, uh, many times we did disc profiling at work. And when I did the disc profiling and just from the basic answers that I did on the disc profiling, it opened up my eyes a lot to who I was. I am an enthusiastic person. I am an inspirational person. I do like details. All that was there. I am an IC. Inspirational, enthusiastic, and then also detail-oriented, and also I like the facts. So all that's there. So when I did that test, it showed me a lot about who I am. So you can learn about who you are and what makes you tick and why. But you have to want to. In order to change, you must first want to change. That's what we said before. Okay? In order to, to help others, but not only help yourself, you have to become more self-aware. And the only way you can do that is study. The only way you can do that is to not be afraid to look at your dark parts. To examine those dark parts. And what are you doing? You're bringing light to them. This is why. This is why I do this. A lot of the anger uh, in our lives comes from that people are different from us. If you can just accept that a lot of people are different, you live a lot more peaceful life. And like we had talked about before, when it comes to religion, you can have two people in the same family at heads because their God is different. But ultimately, what we're trying to do, and this is where we came from when I was Independent Missionary Baptist, okay? My God is right, Independent Missionary Baptist. Pentecostals are wrong. Catholics are wrong. Other Baptists are wrong. That should really be striking to us. Why? Because you have three major religions. Each one of them think they have the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. All of them do. But then you have, even in those religions, different sects. S-E-C-T-S. Why? And each one of them thinks they have it correct. And then you have divisions even within them where they fight. Christians against Christians. Jews against Jews. Muslims against Muslims. You have the radicals of them all. Why? It has been taught to divide. I told you last week and I still... Believe that. God will reveal himself and we'll all say, well, I got that wrong. <clears throat> of all religions. 
Jeremiah 31, what does it say? And they will all see God. And you know that there are other religions that believe that there will be a Messiah that comes. It's not called Messiah. It's called Christ. It's called anointed one. They believe that someone will come and bring peace to the world and also peace and restoration to their nation. Not only in this Bible. Search for God. Search for your spirituality in life. Search for that connection with God. That's what I pray for every one of you. That you have that personal connection because that's where we have, especially when we were Christian. Think about being a Christian. Oh, it's so good. Just all you just believe and have faith. All you got to do and uh, what is faith without grace? And you got to believe in these things. Okay? So here's the carrot, right? Take the carrot. But if you don't, here's hell. I'm going to prong you with the nails in the piece of wood. So if you, this sounds good and I want you to share what I have. That's a great part. But the caveat is if you don't accept me, you're going to die and go to hell. In, uh, in Islam, what is it? Here's all the good and the blessings of Allah. But if you don't accept it, you're an infidel, we're going to kill you. Are we getting it? God is out there. But I believe man has taken religion and used it for selfish purposes. You look at Catholicism. In the very beginning, what were they doing? If you're not like us, kill them. Murder them. Mutilate them. So how has religion been used as societal control? It has. It has. And it is continuing to happen in Israel. They're fighting for a land because God has given it to them. Or a God. It is divided. I know, I believe... <laughs> that everyone in here has had a personal relationship from God from the beginning. From the beginning. And he has blessed you before. He is blessing you now. And he will not stop blessing you. I have never been more blessed in my life. And I've been through some stuff. But I feel blessed right now. But I have been blessed. I am blessed. And I'm going to continue to be blessed. Walk before me. Make it your manner of life to be sincere. It only takes one. You can be that one. You can be that one. I want you to be self-aware of yourself. Self-aware of yourself. Yes, I said that. Be self-aware of yourself. Aware. <laughs> self-aware, self-aware, self Okay, anyway. So just kind of notice. Be mindful of what you do. How what you say affects everyone. We're also on this line of the ripple effect. And I've seen that here recently, no telling how many times. You drop a pebble in the water and what happens? It ripples. So the actions that you do in your life have effect on others. That's mindfulness. You've got to see the way that you act. You have to be honest with yourself that I probably don't like this about myself in order to change. Because everything you do has a ripple effect. I can give it to you in the idea of safety. If I, if I implement a new policy, it affects the whole warehouse. That's why you have people that come back and say, well, what if this happens? You didn't think about this. Well, what about that? Why'd you do this? It's because it has affected others. That is your reality. Your action affects others because it has a ripple effect. You think about um, adultery. How adultery affects people. Not only did it affect you, it also affected the partner and those who were else, those other ones who were involved. So it's a ripple effect. One action that you do has an effect on others. Now let's look at that in a positive way. Because there's a positivity about that too. One kind deed affects others. And we talked about appreciation. Have you ever told somebody that you appreciate them and just genuinely meant it? Because you are noticing their actions, noticing their deeds. How does that have an effect on that person? I tell you, it can change their whole day. It can change their whole life. That one interaction with you can be a testimony in someone's 
uh, can be a testimony in someone's speech. Think about it. Ultimately, everybody is responsible for self. I absolutely believe that. You're responsible for self. But what you do has consequences. But it also has rewards. So don't forget that. It only takes one. One person to lead the people who collectively think the same thing. God is good. God is good. Everybody have a blessed Sabbath. Shabbat shalom.